Hi everyone, I'm Cheryl Cohen. I'm with Arthritis Consumer Experts and we're the host of Arthritis at Home. It is really my pleasure to be here today with Dr. Terry uh, Lynn Fox. She's going to help us, um, the, or when I say us, I mean the arthritis community, uh, learn about and understand the impact Indian residential schools had and continues to have on Indigenous peoples. This is the second of two episodes with Dr. Fox. Uh, and she's going to speak to us today about her research, um, but also the impacts in Indian residential schools have had on Indigenous peoples uh, in Canada. Dr. Fox is from the Blood Tribe within the Blackfoot Confederacy and practices, practices her six gates tapi ways. Dr. Fox has a bachelor's degree in psychology, a master's degree in sociology, and a doctoral degree in education. Her dissertation focus was Indian residential schools and the specific perspectives of Blackfoot Confederacy people on the experiences of survivors from the Blackfoot Confederacy from six residential schools. And the majority of her research is on and about Indian residential schools. Dr. Fox is both directly and indirectly affected by Indian residential schools. She is the daughter of two survivors and is a survivor of Indian day schools herself. She is blessed with four children and six grandchildren. As she likes to say, she can have a hockey team within her family. Uh, welcome, Dr. Fox. It is such an honor again to have you join us here uh, on Arthritis at Home. Thank you, Cheryl. I'll greet you in uh, my traditional language, Oki Nestuakok Abikhoik Modaki. My Blackfoot name is a Miracle Healing Woman. And I received that name when I was an infant, when I was ill. My grandfather gifted me with this name. So I, I, I walk in honor of, of my name. And I hope I, I do my grandfather um, proud um, as I move forward in my life. Thank you so much. Uh, and welcome to our program. Um, Dr. Fox, you and I have uh, I've been blessed to, to know you a little while and, and to be able to speak with you at length about not just your work, but some of your personal experiences. So we're so grateful and indebted to you for joining us again um, to really take a closer look at your research. Um, I wonder if a good place to start is, is for you to tell us, um, I mean, it's, it seems like a question that's rhetorical, you know, why this dissertation topic? Given we know you, your whole family and you yourself uh, are survivors of the Indian, Indian residential school sort of complex, if you will. Um, uh, but, but share with us in your own words how, how you chose the topic or how the topic chose you. <laughs> sure, and I, and I think I think it's uh, that reciprocal. I chose it, but you're right. I, I walk it, I live it. Um, I can't not know what I've experienced within my family and, and my community. So, so firstly, I've shared that I'm, I'm um, one of six children um, born unto two survivors. And um, that, that was not easy, but that was our reality. And um, not knowing my parents' experience um, as I entered into academia, you know, I was interested, intrigued, kind of, you know, why aren't my parents talking about it? Um, I didn't know much about it. And so it was a personal choice, as well as an academic choice. Um, again, the, the balance, uh, personal and, and out, outside, the energy outside, um, I felt compelled to, to learn more. The topic of Indian residential schools and perspectives of Blackfoot Confederacy people um, was quite quite a journey for me from, from start to finish. And um, in that journey, there was much healing to, to be done um, both by myself on so many levels. But um, I think 
also a responsibility that I have now to share what I know, to transfer that knowledge to those who, who want to learn and understand um, at a very um, genuine and, and heartfelt way um, what Indian residential schools were, the impacts on um, children who attended, the impacts on community, and, and where we're at at present. So um, it, it was really a, a challenge when I started because I, I can do, you know, book work, you know, I can read and write and I, you know, formalize some, some things quite easily. But this topic, um, had I known then what I know now, I, I might have ran. Yeah. Right yeah. So it was a personal journey I, I couldn't have known that when I started my PhD program but after I completed the coursework and and did the oral exam and um was ready to move forward um you know I had to just kind of take a a couple of you know a little bit of time there and reflect on on what I had learned I I know I had become a little anger some sadness this deep sadness and of what I was reading in some textbooks and some some frustration but also the understanding of why my parents weren't so forthcoming with their experience to to relive that to talk about it to their children I, I mean you know that would would take so much courage and so much healing for for parents to share their experience. So again, it was what what you're saying. It it came to me. It was it's part of me now. And the real healing came in 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 thinking about it, understanding it, connecting with it, reframing celebrating, honoring, remembering, as many of these, these are connecting to my own spirit and connecting to the, the seven generations before me, which positions me here at present to connect with seven generations that are going to come after me. And so some Indigenous authors, I'll say Eduardo Duran, um, talks about when you heal your spirit, it reaches seven generations before and after you. So when you heal, you heal those generations. And that's really important as an Indigenous person, as a Siksikitsa to be woman and mother, to, to know that what I'm doing, my responsibility to impact my children directly will impact my grandchildren but it impacts my parents and my grandparents. And, and so it's this, this spiritual transformation of, of, of overcoming trauma, but transforming the trauma into, into joy and happiness and celebration, right? That, that it has to heal. It has to be born from, we have to transform it. And it's quite a, you got to think about it. You got to feel it, right? You got to connect in, in such a deep inner level that, that, that you'll feel it. You'll, you'll know when, when you, you feel it on that level. That's quite impactful. And if you, if you tear up, if you cry, if you, if you have these emotions, then you're, you know that you're feeling it on that level. You're and getting it right. <laughs> you're yeah you're you're doing something right when yeah. that happens and 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 that's where the good stuff can can be felt and can we can then move forward um you know connecting with others around us and being part of that transformational change um that I do talk about in my in my dissertation so so kind of I, I hope I've captured well, you have you have in fact I, you know, we work with academics in the health setting, in the health research setting a lot. And I've never heard a person go through their PhD process having to, in, I will say, endure what you have 
over, I know, a decade, um, heal, like think and actually ideate, create the work, and then write it all down. It is, uh, it's like moving a mountain. So I really have a deep appreciation for that. And I think I do for that entire process. And, you know, I actually wish more academics would have to experience deeply what you have, maybe not on the same topic. I, I don't think anyone would wish that on a fellow human being. Um, but that, that they have that deep connection with their work, I think is fundamental. And this, it, I kind of think of it as vibrational across generations. Uh, is I think such a powerful, it creates a visual in my head. It's like that dropping of a pebble in a pond, still pond of water and seeing those concentric rings going, which is what this dialogue process, Dr. Fox, is all about. It is about getting the knowledge, the experience from Indian residential school survivors, those who survived before them, uh, out, out to the world um, through language and uh, both indigenous and non-indigenous language that we can come together in that learning. Um, you know, we, we, as a society, you've said we need to all understand what it means when someone says I was a survivor of an Indian residential school without being gratuitous about it, without misappropriating those experiences in any way. Um, can you share with us, you had a, a, amazing human beings participate in your research. People, uh, you know, from uh, the Blackfoot Confederacy who gave of their experience, their emotions, their minds, their, their spirits. Can you tell us about that and some of the findings that you think are important for our audience to learn about and understand? Sure. Um, so there were 16 um, willing um, participants, uh, survivors and, and elders, knowledge keepers that were part of my my study and without them you know I could not have written such a document so I'm, I'm I'll be forever grateful in my heart and my spirit to them so a couple of questions that I themed around Indian residential schools was you know where were you and and how did you feel when when the apology was given you know on June 11 um 2008 as additionally um you know how did the compensation package how did you feel about that did it you know share share your perspective share your your story um and 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 then from their their stories i i kind of did some analysis but for an apology to occur we we say it from our heart Right. We can think, you know, personally or, or in an organization, we have do's and don'ts, we have these protocols on a big scale. What does that look like? For Canada to have apologized at that time, there were some other countries that had provided this, this um, federal apology to their, their Indigenous peoples. So Australia, New Zealand, um, even Ireland, they had truth and reconciliation, you know, um, South Africa, the apartheid, right? Mm -hmm. there, was, there was many grand apologies and, and truth and reconciliation culminating in the background and, and Canada followed suit. I think it, it had to, be, given the magnitude of, of the residential school, a span of over 130 years, over 130 residential schools, over 150,000 children. So that's, we can't push it under the rug anymore. So the survivor said for you to apologize genuinely, for me to feel that you apologize to me, 
You don't read it from a piece of paper. You don't get someone else to write it for you. You, you, you might actually go to each community and openly talk to the members in that, you know, on that traditional land and, and, and provide that apology. It's not just, you know, photocopy this, I'll say it here and there. It, it needs to come from the heart, it needs to, to be felt. And I need to feel it. I need to feel it. It's not that you're just saying it. It's not just the messenger. It's the person receiving the message that is integral. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and, and for many of them, they, they said, okay, what now? You've apologized. What's, what are you going to change now? What's the action in, 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 sure, in knowing you've apologized? It's deep felt. Now, how are we going to um, change the, the action part to ensure that um, you meant what you said? So they were waiting for more to happen from since 2008 and we're at 2021 and there's still no real change being, being felt by indigenous people specifically six gated to be people um, where where land claims are, are still you know being talked about in the courts it's a slow process um, the Indian Act is still quite prominent in controlling Indian peoples um, you know from everything from A to Z so so these these changes are slow moving it's it, it just kind of seemed not too real for the survivors. But also, you know, the experiences that, that they had, um, given that I was very, very somewhat general in the questions I formulated, I did not ask if they were abused in any way. However, this, this is kind of where, where I'm so honored and humbled and I feel, guided by the ancestors and, and our ceremonial ways that many of them responded with um, the, the abuses that they went through. And, and given that I, I did not ask directly about it, but they freely shared, speaks volumes to their own strength as survivors. As, as spiritual people that they could share that openly with me and that I could, I could somehow transform that in, onto a document where I can help teach people that read it um, and, and to honor what they're telling me and how do I write it in a way that respects them, respects that, that experience they had and when people read it that they 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 understand but it's it's not a it's not in a dis, disrespectful way that they feel it they have the empathy they feel the com, they have compassion and and they it's touched them at a deeper level than than they may have ever been touched before by reading you know a document so in that process, I'm honoring, I'm, I'm, I'm all, all thinking as I was writing it, I'm honoring the survivors, I'm honoring the process of, of research and writing, I'm honoring academia, I'm honoring six gates to be ways of knowing and being, I'm honoring me, I'm honoring those seven generations and I'm honoring, you know, the seven generations to come. And so that's a big responsibility for me. Yeah. I don't take it lightly. And, and as I share, some of the elders will say, those who are ready to hear what you have to say, they will come. They will come in, in, in different ways, different times, but they will come. And so when that happens, that's your responsibility to share respectfully, openly, and, and to know that the spiritual strength is with you to, 
to speak as directly about the research and the stories past, present and future as I can. So I, 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 I guess I'm walking my walk when I say my name is Abby Huikamadaki, Miracle Healing Woman. I, I don't take it lightly. Yeah. So the, the survivors that shared these things often without questioning, um, they felt if you were to look at those two questions you mentioned at the start here about the apology and then about the compensation piece. So the apology piece, what I am gleaning uh, from your sharing, from your teaching is uh, it wasn't thought by the survivors to be heartfelt. It wasn't felt to be the process uh, that it through, through which it was given was not as meaningful of, as it should have or could have been. Um, and so, I mean, even the learning from that is massive. It is incredible what we can learn from people who have directly experienced the trauma and what their expectations are. And if that's not the kernel of truth, in truth of reconciliation, I don't know what is. When it comes to the compensation piece, Dr. Fox, can you share with us what um, the survivors, uh, the as participants, it's a horrible word. I think survivors is certainly the people who helped you learn. Uh, let's, let's refer to them that way. The people that helped you learn about the compensation piece, what is it that you found from, from the body of work? So when I asked them of, about the um, Indian Residential School compensation package, um, generally speaking, you received money if you attended. Yeah. And then there was this other process that you went through or chose to go through if you were if there was abuses. And so that was a, an, another route, an extension. And so many had received um, the the attendance compensation. Others chose to move forward with the the abuse and and the scale of the financial or monetary compensation that they received. And many said that it 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 wasn't enough that that it wasn't about the money that their their language was they were punished for speaking the language, the ceremonies they could not practice, they they were dis, displaced, disconnected from family, from community, from speaking the language, from the ceremony, um, and, and in turn, I guess an, an add on is that what did the parents and grandparents? How did they feel? How did they see it when they couldn't speak? the language to the children where that's a natural transference of, of speaking a language and then and whatever that you know encapsulates it's it's your culture and and you know some quotes that really stood out was um you know I'll just openly share that one survivor said um I felt like I felt like a whore the government paid me you know after you know, I was raped as a child. So if if you look at it from that perspective, rather than oh well they received money, you know what's the big deal? But you know what it it's we can't even imagine. We yeah. we, we can go there, but because these children had experienced these 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 this violence, the the worst violence a child could ever experienced over a period of, of time, not just once, but many had experienced physical abuse, sexual abuse, verbal abuse. Um, they were told not to feel, so they suppressed their emotions. And so we see much um, disease and, and ills in First Nations um, populations that that it's going to take seven generations to even get to a good point where we see statistics 
you know, trickling down from, from high rates of ill health and poverty and unemployment and incarceration. And so it, we can learn so much from these stories and on many levels and, and many, you know, realms of, of society today that I would, again, I was honored that they openly shared, freely shared with me, given, you know, many of them knew my parents or my grandparents and they knew, they knew my family. And so they, they, they saw me as not just this researcher, but as connection, as kin. And that, that made the difference for me as a researcher when I, when I took this task on little did I know that again I would be transformed in, in the, the healing part for me on on so many levels and connecting to the survivors I I, I value them and and understanding my parents and grandparents but but then how do I share that with my children and as my grandchildren grow older, how do I help them understand it where it's not out of anger, but it's out of um, compassion and respect and, and in a good way that we can help celebrate the spirits of, of these children, of, of who we are and the strength and resilience that we're gonna carry as we move forward. Yeah. Um, the you know, it just, when I hear you speak, it's so clear to me anyway, in my little head and in my big heart, I hope, that um, understanding, knowing, healing, being part of that process, walking with and supporting Indigenous peoples, it, uh, the, the Indian residential school system, it just inflicted this, the, the breadth and the depth of the trauma is almost hard to fathom. And it didn't just impact people, you know, little kids going off to school, never seeing their parents. I mean, some people just say, oh, you know, well, my kid went to boarding school and survived. Okay, people, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about children taking, taken from their home and the, and a systematic attempt to crush their culture, crush everything about knowing of themselves and their families, to crush it, to make it go away. And the depth of trauma resulting from that in all realms of our humanness are unfathomable. And you used a word, resilience. And I cannot think of a people with greater resilience than my indigenous friends, my what I hope are my brothers and sisters uh, on this land. It is unbelievable to me um, how people have survived, how many have thrived. Dr. Fox, you're a you know, beautiful example of that, but how many have not thrived, how many have had, you know, scars carved into them that uh, will be a long time in, in healing. And that is why we're, you're, you know, I know we've spoken before and we've held discussions in circles with the arthritis community and you talk about our path forward and it is our path forward. Um, and, uh, all of finding the goodness, uh, maybe we can end with you sharing those five words with us um, on, on truth and reconciliation and why they're so important. The concept that you, you really arrived at at the end of your, not at the end of, but probably very near the beginning of your writing process, this, this almost epiphany that you had. Um, I think that would be a really, good way for us to close our conversation today. Well, for sure. Um, I, and I love sharing elder quotes from, from other documents and, and I carry them and I, I share them. And those who 
intently listen will remember. So these words are quite simple. Um, Charlie Fisher, an elder um, that was um, quoted in um, uh, a book. Um, he said, if there's five, five words in this natural law, which we, we live in as, as humans, but um, the five words are, the first one is respect. So if we understood respect, respect for uh, plants, animals, the air, the water, uh, respect for our creator, respect for ourselves, then, you know, that's the first kind of, kind of word on this natural law. The second two words were, if you understood respect, you would then know what good was and bad. So what was accepted and what wasn't. And that's part mm -hmm. of your taboos, that's your everyday realities. So three words there. The last two words were a good life. Or if you understood the first three words, a good life would follow. A good life means you, you have food, clothing, shelter. A good life means you're connected to your spirit. You have your connections to your kin, your family. You, re you respect everything outside of you, but yourself as well. You know the do's and don'ts. That's a nat those are natural laws. That's a good life. And don't, aren't we all wanting to live that? Don't we all deserve to lead a good life? Oh, <laughs> well, well said. And uh, I think, um, I think we're so lucky to have people like you in the world to teach us and um, to walk with because uh, it's not just about teaching and learning, it is about doing. And we hope that our viewers, Dr. Fox, have, I know they've learned a ton. And, uh, and I know they're all engaged in, in community, whether it's the arthritis community, the Indigenous community, or the settler community, the non-Indigenous community. They're people who do take action. And so I hope from our episode last week uh, on National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, and this week, uh, they will walk, um, the, they will, I love this phrase you've used in sessions, walkaways, not takeaways, walkaways. Takeaways is mm -hmm. something you take for yourself and you head off into the hills. Walkaways are things you take and you walk with people uh, to make change, and in my mind anyway. And, uh, and I, I really thank you for giving us that opportunity uh, to walk away and, and do something, um, but also to walk with Indigenous peoples uh, in a deeper understanding of Indian residential schools, the, the impacts on Indigenous peoples, and specifically the people who deeply shared with you in your, in your research. Uh, at the end of, uh, of this video, there will be uh, links to Dr. Fox's dissertation, um, as well as to other really great uh, resources to learn more and also uh, to take action. Uh, it's all about what we do together to make um, this transformational change that is so deeply needed in, um, in this country. So Dr. Fox, thank you again so much for uh, your time, your expertise, your love and caring and spirit. We're very, very indebted to you. Thank you. It's been an honor and a pr privilege. Bye, everyone. See you next week. <laughs>